Good morning, everybody. My name is Anne Yates. I'm a midwife advisor at the International Confederation of Midwives, and I'm here with my colleague, my fellow New Zealander, Jude Cottrell. Now, Jude Cottrell and I, since 2018, have been working on a project, a very important project for the International Confederation of Midwives, creating a set of resources for you to use to teach respectful maternity care. So what's significant about today is that we're going to focus particularly on the trauma that is experienced by women worldwide and the trauma and dis that happens when people are disrespected or abused. And it's very significant for me because everything that Jude will have to say today is relatable to every woman on this planet. Jude, thank you so much. Mm. It's our pleasure to have you presenting your wonderful knowledge on neuroscience of trauma. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. I'll just move myself in here. Hello, everybody. Um, my name's Jude, and I'm a midwife based in New Zealand, and uh, it's been my pleasure to work with the ICM Putting, helping putting together this respect workshop and we've uh, presented it in Dubai and Paraguay and Namibia and quite a lot in New Zealand and every workshop's been very very different but one thing that has come through in all of them is a sense of urgency from midwives about the disrespect that women are suffering from right through across this planet and also the disrespect that midwives find themselves within, within often as well. So what this um, talk is about is looking at the neuroscience of trauma um, and how that affects the brain. So what I'd like to do is just work with you through slowly how this works and it's a shame we can't have more dialogue and have more questions. But anyway, I'll do my best. Um, so, yeah, I'll start straight in and start looking at, if just as a quick review that you've probably all had when you were being student midwives, about the human brain. And just to remember that um, we've got the, the human brain was built over a long period of evolution. And if you look at the back of the brain, at the on the right-hand side of the slide, we've got the primitive reptilian hind brain, and that is the part that keeps all of our organs going and our toenails growing. All happens below the level of consciousness uh, to keep us alive, and that's been there right from when mammals started to uh, come on board and reptiles. And then as the human brain got to grow, uh, we developed what's called the limbic system, which is the bit in the orangey bit in the middle there. And that's, uh, again, runs under the level of consciousness. We don't, we don't have control over that. It's the part that mediates birth and labor. So we midwives work with the limbic part of the brain a lot. And it's where the amygdala resides as well. And we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. And then the whole bit across the top is called the neocortex, which is the place where we have, well, the only place that we have conscious thinking. And that's where our vision and our sight and our hearing and our language and our philosophies and our wisdom and values are all based. And we have access, we have conscious access to that. Um, so what we're going to look at now is to go on and just quickly have a quick look at the amygdala, which is not a discrete little ball or anything like an organ in a brain. It's part of a whole neural networks, but it's the most amazing uh, organ, really, in that it's associated with experiences of attachment. So the way that you as a baby were brought up and the sort of parenting you had helps develop how you are attached to your parents and concomitant to that, how you relate to the rest of the world and to other people. It's where fear is mediated from and it's where early memory and emotion across a lifetime are stored. So if somebody's had something traumatic happen to them, the memory of that will and can be stored in the amygdala. Um, and it's a place where um, PTSD and some of the anxiety disorders, um, some of the amygdalic dysfunctions that we know about as midwives, 
are st st all stem from. Also, the amygdala is like constantly like a little lighthouse looking around all the time, checking out, is that bus going to run over me? Is that a lion that's coming in the bushes over there? Is that tree going to pull down? Is she going to be nasty to me? She looks very nasty. It's constantly below the level of consciousness assessing your environment. And when it sees something that might be of danger to you, because its main job is to keep you safe, when it sees something that might be of danger to you, it will trigger the autonomic nervous system to go into action. The fight, flight, and collude systems uh, that keep us safe. And so I think it's really important that when we are thinking about trauma, especially birth trauma, we understand the mechanisms of the amygdala and how it works. Um, so let's just have a quick Okay, so I'd like to talk you through the trauma ladder, which I think gives a good explanation of how the human brain responds to big events. So let's have a look at the very bottom of the ladder first, where this is where most of us wish to reside. This is where we, uh, we have all sorts of things happening in our lives. We have good things, we have weddings and new babies and feasts and celebrations, and we're all up. And all of us are going to suffer in life at some point as well. People are going to die. There are going to be accidents. There is going to be injuries. There's going to be illnesses. And for somebody who has got good attachment and has um, able to manage their life events well, they go up and down with the waves and they remain calm. They remain grounded. They can be relaxed and they will remain engaged with other people. They don't need to take themselves off by themselves. Um, and they'll be resilient to the pushes and pulls and the big waves of life. And when these things happen, they may, they may have a caesarean, they may have a shoulder dystocia, they may have a baby that goes to neonatal intensive care unit, but they won't perceive those as a trauma. So trauma starts to appear uh, when we can't de-escalate the feelings when there's neurological arousal, when the amygdala is really firing off saying, woo, 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 careful, things are going wrong here, I need to protect you. So as that neurological arousal comes up to the first rung of the ladder, if we're looking at the left-hand side of it, people's defences will come up. You'll notice that they are saying, well, it wasn't me that did that, or um, well, I've never liked her, she's a horrible person, or um, I feel so ashamed, they found out that I'm a hopeless midwife again. Those sort of defences will start to ring sounds for you to say this person is on the trauma ladder. And then as that neurological arousal, the amygdala is firing off more, often women particularly will go quiet. They will um, not find their words, not be able to tell you what they need. And one of the things that I often say to new midwives is uh, always ask for dissent. Instead of just saying, if, if the woman says, um, yes, doctor, that's fine. Anything you say, I'll have an epidural. I'll do what you want. A wise midwife would say, Lulu, is there anything in you that has a no about that? And wait for the answer. Ask her, ask for the dissent, because often it looks like consent. And then when people are right up near the top of the trauma ladder, they'll feel panicky. And that's when the flight and fright and fawning and freezing and flopping occurs. And you'll notice that people who are in that state, they're not talking about climate change or the politics of their country or anything. They go very quiet. And then again, that again can look like it's consent. And then if people are coming up the other side of the ladder, which is often a bit more of an aggressive side, if on the bottom rung, they'll feel they'll start being a little bit irrational, feeling frustrated, things aren't right, I'm not happy, this is wrong. You can, as a midwife, be aware that this is them with an amygdala that is aroused. And then they can become angry and aggressive and get into an absolute rage. So as people, as that um, trauma 
it goes right up to the top of the ladder. The things that can happen in the red across the top of the screen there are people can freeze. And this is like the little gazelles on the savannah, where if a little gazelle baby, let's say a newborn baby gazelle, is having kids sitting there feeding, and then suddenly a lion comes along. And if the little gazelle baby girl hunkers down and doesn't move a whisker, Mr. Lion will walk right past and not catch him. But as soon as the little gazelle freaks out and goes for a run, and the lion will have him sunch and gazelle as deadly bones. And humans have that response as well. We can freeze. We can look like possums in the headlights. We can not be able to find our words. And that's often called in the literature speechless terror, that there are no words. People are just like, oh, I didn't know what to say. I couldn't speak for myself. And it's taken me years to work it out. There's another thing the brain will do is dissociate in order to keep you safe. And that's a funny thing. It's where people that have had it experience it as their brain sort of shifting away from them and they don't have full access to their brain because the amygdala will do everything to keep you safe. And I had a woman once who had been raped as a 19-year-old, and when she got to the pushing stage of uh, labor, the muscle memory of the rape felt similar to the pressure of the baby in the vagina, and she dissociated and the fetal heart was bonking right down in its boots. And the midwife started yelling at her, push, you've got to push, you've got to push. And the more they yelled, the more she dissociated, the more she wasn't able to act. And there was a bit of a disaster around all that. Women will also, people will also start shaking when they are very traumatized. Um, and that's a sort of very primitive way animals will do it too. Primitive way of trying to set themselves neurologically. And I used to say to people, oh, it's because of the drugs, you're in theatre and often people shake. But actually, it's a very, very um, known sign of trauma. And the other thing the brain can do at that point is um, go into a state of what we call transitory psychosis. And I think I've suffered from that. When my 18-year-old daughter got lost in Mexico. I didn't know if she was dead or alive for about three or four days. And I think at that time I was behaving in a psychotic way. Um, I certainly wasn't behaving normally at all. I couldn't sleep. I was saying funny things. I was absolutely fixated on the phone and the computer. And I, I would say my symptoms were very psychotic. So these are all of the things that will are the signs of trauma. And the signs of trauma, often the first signs are when you're feeling, I'm not okay, and you're okay, or you're okay, you're not okay, and I'm okay. When people aren't feeling, I'm okay, and you're okay, that is the, one of the first signs that people are going to become traumatized. So um, when... We have physical violence of any sort, uh, say these things are happening. We have very good ways of um, litigating them. So if, if I smack you or hit you or run over you or shoot you, then the laws and the policies of the land will step in to uh, deal with me. So we're going to go on now and talk about uh, what happens when we have psychological harm. Next slide. So with psychological pain, or, uh, there's a very lovely um, writings from a guy called David Bocelli, and I'm just going to read it. And he says here, if you read with me on the slide, he says, we do not have to have experienced physical danger to have, be, to, to have long-term symptoms of trauma. Unpleasant social or emotional events can elicit the same responses. 
So if you think about that, what he's saying, and he goes on further to say down below, and I'll read this before we discuss it, with the development of the cortex, the big white bit across the top of the brain, the human species is capable of experiencing death in two ways. Physical death of the organism, and that's what we talked about with the first ladder thing, where physical, we are very, very primed to keep our bodies alive and not to die and not to get injured. But he goes further to say human beings can also have psychological death. Um, a psychological death of the mind, and that can come from lack of control, lack of predictability, a fallen status, or a lack of social support. And what I think is really interesting, especially for us as midwives, is that if I hurt somebody with a knife, uh, or I run over them in my car, there are all these mechanisms to make sure I learn my lesson. But when we hurt somebody psychologically, then most of us are at have not many resources in which we know how to deal with that. I see this in the hospitals where there is abuse going on to women and to midwives, and nobody knows what on earth to do about it. And this is what really interests me and what I think would be really nice for you to discuss when you get together after this talk, to think about how does psychological violence come up for you in your workplace? There's a guy called Marshall Rosenberg who's done a lot of work for the nonviolent communication people in San Francisco. And he writes in his book, um, if violence means acting in a way that causes hurt or harm, then much of how we communicate be, can be called violent, which will activate the amygdala and send people into trauma. And though the way we communicate can be by having racial bias or by discrimination. So we've heard stories in our uh, workshops where people from one village were treated very different in, differently in the labor ward from people from another village. People from different religions are t treated differently. People with different skin colors are treated differently. People with different disabilities or smells are treated differently by the staff. And that Marshall Rosenberg would call psychological violence, which would cause trauma, which we know what happens in the amygdala when there's trauma. So he goes on to talk about all the other ways that we can experience psychological violence. It can be from when we feel judged and not good enough, when we're not given unconditional love, when we're bullied, uh, when we are expecting to be blamed for things that might go wrong in births, or when women are blamed for not doing it right, you caused this stillbirth or you caused caused something but ghastly to happen by not eating properly or being too fat. Um, psychological violence, according to Marshall Workenberg, it can be caused by abandonment. And I think this is a big thing for us that when we say goodbye to women going into theatre and just leave them all alone to go and face that, or we don't keep emotional or physical contact with them when they're going through really big experiences can be considered as psychological violence. Uh, when our status is threatened, we can experience that as hugely traumatic. Um, it sounds odd, but the way the status that we hold in this world really affects us because when we were back in cave times, it, the person with the highest status got to eat the most, have the most sex, have the most babies, and probably have the most go at life. So loss of status to us and fear of losing status can be highly traumatic. Um, social exclusion is another thing he talks a lot about. You know, you've got the young midwifery student in the tea room and she walks in and everybody stops talking or nobody introduces themselves or nobody welcomes her and she feels as though she's sitting in a room unknown and excluded. Highly traumatizing for the human brain. We also can have experienced psychological violence when we're not listened to. Um, and when people respond to us with anger rather than with gentleness. So all of those things can put us on the trauma ladder, 
and also our imaginations can as well. So people that suffer from anxiety and they catastrophize things and they um, feel that they might be shamed for things, all of those things can be very traumatizing for people. And I think when midwives know about psychological violence and how that traumatizes the brain, we can really start to see how important our social interactions are with people. So let's just go on and have a quick look at the brain again. And there's the amygdala sitting in the middle. And let's just have a quick look at the physiology of what it does. So something violent has happened, whether it be physical or psychological. And what it does is it sends a message down to the, um, uh, we, it creates a stress response uh, from the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary to the sympathetic neuros, um, nervous system. And from that, uh, we get adrenaline and noradrenaline and cortisol all being pumped out at high rates into the system. And we know what that feels like. Your heart rate goes up, your breathing goes up, you have all of the fight and flight responses. But let's see what else it does. So what it also does when you've got all those um, hormones swooshing around in your body, it suppresses the neocortex. Now, if you think why that might be important, without the neocortex fully online, it makes it really hard for people to be, make rational decisions, to give informed consent, to use their known wisdom and their own values to help them in that situation. So we've got the only conscious part of the brain quite significantly suppressed when there's a huge sympathetic nerve, parasympathetic nervous system response. But wait, there's more. So let's have a look at the next thing. So these two systems are very, very interlinked. Um, and then the other thing that is really important to know is that if these uh, this hormonal setup isn't de-escalated by some of the things that midwives do just naturally and knowingly. If, it, if we, the amygdala remains aroused, what it does is it, across here, it suppresses the hypothalamus, and the, sorry, the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is hugely uh, involved in integrating the trauma memory into the neocortex. So what it does is, if somebody, say, had a shoulder dystocia last night, the hippocampus works really hard to take that memory and those neuronal impulses out of the limbic and the, the unconscious parts of the brain and enable the neocortex to come back online and the woman can apply her own knowing and wisdom to the situation. So when there isn't that de-escalation from the trauma ladder and these low, there's low grade trauma hormones swishing around the body all the time. This is one of the key things that causes post-traumatic stress disorders, anxiety disorders and depression. Uh, so, and really, I think that what this is teaching us is the importance of understanding uh, why why that happens and we're going to go on and look at what midwives can do to actually mitigate some of those problems. Um, okay, let's just move on here. Um, so just, just to have a little look at this woman here, if you can have a really close look at her and you look at her eyes, if you were the midwife looking after her, what would her eyes be telling you? In fact, this woman went on and had a very bad time. And I think most of us could see that her eyes, she's dissociated, her eyes aren't glossy and alive and loving the baby. She's just absolutely in survival mode. And so when we know that, we can know that her neocortex is inhibited, that she won't be able to bring her own logic to the situation. She won't be able to bring her natural wisdom to the situation or her own rationality and work it out. She'll just be in a sort of limbo, zombie state of disassociation. And if we look at the next woman here, again, look at her. 
Her amygdala is probably in a high state of arousal as well, and she's probably could become frozen like the gazelles. She could, would probably report retrospectively she felt numb, she doesn't remember it, her timings are all off. She probably would have what we call tonic immobility, where she's just lying there. She can't do a thing really to help herself. She's probably not got many words. You don't hear women when they're lying in these sort of states talking about climate change or Brexit or the local politics or the local music scene. They usually don't find language at that point. And she could very well become dissociated. Remember that we talked about how her brain actually becomes not very accessible for her. And this really brings up issues for midwives about how we actually care for people in this situation. And this other one is where I've, I've got a picture here of um, a person who's in a high state of arousal. And what I think is happening is it's a bit like the boy races we have in New Zealand. I don't know if we have you have them in your country, but we have young boys who get into hot cars and what they do is they get on a gravel road and they put their foot full on the accelerator and they put the handbrake full on and the car's trying to go forward and to try and brake itself at the same time. And what it does is the wheels just spin on the spot and make heaps of fire and smoke and gravel flying everywhere and they don't go anywhere. And this is sort of like what's happening for women in these states. They've got the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system trying to work to calm things and to keep the person safe and they work against each other and she has this tonic immobility she can't move she can't think clearly and she's in a difficult difficult state um so just moving on also there you go women might start shaking and trembling trying to reset their their nervous systems which is evoked by the brainstem, just trying to set, reset the neural pathways into something that's calm. So let's just have a look at, it might be nice for you, I don't know if you want to, to take a moment to acknowledge what's actually going on for you in your nervous system right now. So the um, educators might like, might like to just stop the video at the moment and just check in with the class and ask yourselves, how are you relating to that? Have you felt those things in yourself or have you seen that in the fam families and women that you've looked after? Okay, so let's just move on now. If any of you are interested in uh, reading more about trauma theory, Dan Siegel is the guy to go to. He's written some beautiful books. It's not about birth trauma, it's about birth in general. But he talks about the river of life and that what we all hope to do is to be able to be flexible like a river and flow with wide banks um, where life's experiences are felt deeply but easily integrated and they don't become traumas. And he says that when we can find language um, within an empathetic environment that it plays a significant role in neuroplasticity um, so this is firstly what will happen is that the uh, if say a midwife goes into a room in the middle of the night and says to the woman perhaps hi there Susie I was at your birth yesterday and I know you had a shoulder dystocia and I wonder if you'd like to talk about it and the woman might say no I don't feel like it I want to go to sleep no it's fine that's fine but Asking the woman to find language for her feelings can be really, really helpful because what it does, it will firstly activate her amygdala and she might feel distressed and crying and remembering the shoulder dystocia and how worried everybody was. But then that will activate mirror neurons in both the midwife and the woman and it will enable the midwife to feel what the woman is saying and to enable the woman to use her own mirror neurons to feel the, own, the midwife's own feelings of inner safety. And by the midwife standing, sitting there with her, with her own amygdala calmed and open to listening to the woman's feelings, it will enable that 
the, those neural pathways to go via the hippocampus, out of the amygdala, via the hippocampus, and let the woman use her own wisdom to integrate the memory of that shoulder dystocia. She can use her own belief structures, her own religious beliefs, or her own wisdom to make sense of it for herself, rather than us as midwives telling her. And Dan Siegel would say that that process will widen her river of tolerance because she feels why she feels safe enough to express her feelings and explore her feelings. And he says when that's not present and the woman doesn't have someone that will do that with her, that on the left-hand side of the bank there that can end up in depression and rigidity. She has to be know where the coffee cups all sit and what's happening at 12 o'clock and a very rigid approach to life. Or it can... On the other side of the river there, he's got that it can end up in chaos and anxiety where the woman's flooded with anxious feelings and unable to um, function without a lot of anger and irritability and uh, compounding thoughts. Anyway, if you're interested in this sort of thing, Dan Siegel writes beautifully about it and it so applies to us as midwives. Okay. So just to finish off, really, I want to talk about some of the latest stuff about interpersonal neurobiology. And this is so exciting because what it's saying is that um, we all think we're little individuals and all your little brains are sitting in your room now, all thinking their little brains all on their own. And yet what the neuroscientists are telling us now is that we are hugely affected by all the other brains that we come near. Even me, sitting here in New Zealand, and you're where you are, your brain will be being changed by what you're allowing into it. And this is what's so lovely for us as midwives to know more about. In fact, we've known about it for millions of years, and now the neuroscience is catching up, that what we bring, when we bring a calmed amygdala and we've done, our, we've done our own inner work, we can be very um, healing for other people who are um, experiencing trauma. So let's just have a look at how that works. This is a lovely picture of a koala bear in the fires in Australia. And this is Dan Siegel again, his writing is lovely. He says, I'm reading here, read with me, our brains rely on other brains to remain healthy, especially under stress. We turn to each other for comfort, regulation and stability. We appear to be able to cope with anything when we are connected to those for whom we care and care for us. So this is really acknowledging why the care side and the partnership side of midwifery makes such a huge difference and in many ways equal perhaps even more to the clinical care that we give women. Let's have a look at this next side. So this is again Dan Siegel. He says, we cherish the concept of ourselves as individuals, yet we live with the paradox that we constantly regulate each other's biological states. We instinctively reach out to others for safety and protection to be seen and understood and accepted. We are a tribal species and we cannot exist as an individual. And this is just saying why your brain as a midwife with the brain of somebody who is in a difficult, challenging state makes such a difference. And so how do these brains work? Well, the neuroscientists call it the social synapse because it's so important now that we use a crop between our brains, across the gaps between us, we have all these things that connect our brains, such as the gestures we use, our smiles or our lack of smiles, the language and the words we use, that when we make eye contact with someone deeply and we're with them, that will affect their brains enormously. That when we touch somebody in a way that's kind and compassionate can be incredibly soothing and bring people down that trauma ladder. When we tell stories about um, to each other, it can teach and soothe. Uh, our body language can hugely affect other people's brains and their brains will be reshaped because of it. 
smells affect other brains, and all of these things are sent through space via sight and sound in our senses. And it's why it's so important for us as midwives to have that um, internal understanding of ourselves and know that what we bring in our brains and our being into a room massively affects the trauma levels women might feel. Um, I always think about it, yeah, I don't know if ever you've had your car battery run down and you need jumper leads. But I always think, you know, you put a jumper lead on the good battery and a jumper lead on the dead battery and you pull power from it. And I often feel like that as a midwife, that uh, when somebody's amygdala is on warp speed and I can metaphorically let them jumper lead into my amygdala, which is saying, because I know it and believe it so deeply, birth is normal, you can do this. We will get through this. I'm going to hang in there with you. They can get that across the social synapse via the metaphorical jumper leads, and it makes such a difference to women. So just to finish off, I think it's really lovely to acknowledge that the things that most midwives do, just naturally because we are those sort of people, are things that de-escalate and bring people down from the trauma ladder. So the, the important tool of sitting down with women and enabling them to find language so they can find language in the conscious part of their brain to explain what happened in their unconscious brain is worth gold. Um, inquiring every postnatal visit and asking them how they're feeling about the birth and listening to them. Um, and the understanding that neuroplasticity occurs, that when people can find language and their stories are heard, that the brains will actually change and integrate that knowledge so that it doesn't become a trauma for them. The journeying with is something that a lot of midwives have talked about of not trying to fix the journey for the women, but walking alongside them and that people don't feel abandoned or alone. Compassion is another big thing in our toolkit of not feeling the pain ourselves, but having compassion for what that other person is feeling. Um, when by all the things we do, by advocating, and creating safety for women, we keep people down the bottom of the trauma ladder. By our own mindfulness, when we understand how our brains and how our thoughts subconsciously affect other people is a hugely important part of us. Um, by caring about the oxytocin levels in the room and what that does when they are not, we, when we bring oxytocin levels down by bringing joy and lightness and belief into a room makes a massive difference to people. Um, and talking to women about how they can take their bodies back after they have had a challenging experience, talking to them about how they can reclaim their bodies and their sense of themselves after this big thing's happened. And that could be by massage, by swimming, by singing, all the things that enable people to come back to themselves is something that midwives can often really help women with. So that's really the end of this little talk about the neuroscience of trauma and where midwives sit around it. And it's been a pleasure talking with you and I hope you have time now to talk about that amongst yourselves. Good luck with it. Yes, Thank you, Jude. That was really awesome. And I've heard that presentation a number of times and I hear something different every time. So thank you so much. And I think one of the big take homes here is that actually be kind. And be kind means reaching out to people who are in situations that are out, often out of their control and show some empathy and some decency and just sometimes just simply holding somebody's hand. Thank you, Jude. That's mm. wonderful. Lovely, Anne. Thank you.